like for everyone to think for a moment about the value of human life. And does one person's life have any more value than another person's? The current fee-for-service healthcare system rations out care based on the patient's ability to pay. I believe this is unethical. It is criminal. 95% of the country is still functioning on this fee-for-service model. I believe everyone should be treated the same. Everyone should have access to primary care regardless of their ability to pay. Fassel Syed. Welcome to another episode of Fassel and Friends. We're here because we believe everyone deserves access to quality primary care and ChenMed needs physicians to take care of them. Tonight's topic is integrating social care into primary care. My co-host and moderator of the chat is Dr. Dan McCarter. Welcome Dr. Dan. How are you doing? Good. It's great to be with you Fassel. Good to be back again. You know, in my house, Tuesday nights are, I don't know about your home, but in our home, it's Taco Tuesdays. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I barely made it on show tonight. <laughs> the cleanup can always be variable. You just never know what's going to happen. My, we, before we welcome the guests, you know, my kids, especially my two younger ones, are eight and four. So it's always a disaster. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, I'm very excited about tonight's topic. Obviously, it's something that we're both very passionate about, and we have like one of the leading experts in the country joining us tonight to talk about this topic. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Bob Phillips. Bob, welcome to the show. Fassel, so glad to be with you. Thank you so much. And I wish I'd had a chance to have tacos with you. <laughs> well, you come, you come to Tampa, believe me, you come to Tampa, we can make it happen. <laughs> well, welcome. I would love to hear about your story. Yeah, you're a family medicine doctor. You've had an incredible career and you're doing amazing things right now. We have a we have a shortage, obviously, of primary care. Internal medicine, most of the internal medicine residents aren't pursuing primary care. Even when we have family medicine residents are doing things like urgent care work, emergency room, they're doing hospitalist work. Really, you know, I would love to see more of a shift, more of a movement towards quality primary care. And so I'd love to, I'd love for you to start off by telling us about your story, where you did residency, what kind of program it was and, and how your life went from there. Certainly. So, so Fazl, I trained at University of Missouri uh, in Columbia, Missouri, um, because the program had a partnership program that allowed me to um, explore more of my interest around research and around policy. I was trying to combine medicine, research and policy in some career path. And it was also, uh, it had a lot of rural opportunity. And I, that's one of the things I fell in love with. I'm from a rural area, but I, I recognize the value of relationships by working in a rural practice and the ability to get outside of the academic health center and work in rural settings was, uh, was a real um, important thing to me. Um, what I didn't know is that I would fall in love with working in federally qualified health centers there and working in a, in a community health needs assessment related to that. And it was really then um, in my fellowship when I stayed at University of Missouri to focus on health services research that I got involved in a, a countywide community health needs assessment that involved the academic health center, the federally qualified health center and the health department. Um, and I worked with some fantastic geographers to that, that could translate our clinical data into the footprint of our practices on the landscape. And, and I realized that that was the front end of community oriented primary care, the ability to define your community and then characterize it. And I thought this is fantastic. I, I can now see with clear definition who we're serving and who we're not serving and figure out where the holes in the safety net are in my community. And that actually turned into two or three different expansion grants for our FQHC. And that was the, the really the, the launch of my, my, my finding my niche of how you combine research with a policy approach to improving access to healthcare. Um, and it's a reason, it's, it's what took me to Washington DC to work at the Robert Graham Center, the American Academy of Family Physicians Health Policy Research Center right out of fellowship was the idea that I could take this model and expand it. So that's my initial story and it, it just turned into a full career. 
Wow. So when you when you were first defining the the boundaries, especially in the rural area, I'm I'm familiar. I joined a large FQHC right out of residency as well. It was saying once you're an FQHC doctor, you're an always you're always a community doctor. In the urban settings, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward to kind of lay out the boundaries. But when you're talking over large spaces of area, especially in the rural rural parts of the country, how would you define those areas? Well, you actually use your patient data. You use their addresses to to populate every census tract around you, and then you rank them to figure out where are the areas that you're serving the most. Um, and and Fassel, this became ten years later. This became a tool that we built for the Health Resources and Services Administration, called the UDS Mapper, that takes the data from every federally qualified health center in the country, and shows them their footprint on the landscape, and it helps define the this the holes in the safety net where FQHC expansion needs to take place. So, um, and it's fascinating when you show physicians the geography that they're serving. What we found in my own practice and having them estimate their service area is that most physicians overestimate their service area by 100 percent. They they often capture the right geography, but then they expand that boundary by a lot. So getting specific is really helpful for helping them figure out who they're serving and, and what their social determinants look like. Yeah, I, 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 I love how you're, you know, you're, you're helping identify and talk about the social determinants. You know, oftentimes we see uh, in our world, I mean, we're, we exist in the similar populations, actually the same neighborhoods as the FQHCs, Chen Med, and, and issues like home insecurity, food insecurity are really the drivers with our patient population, not only our patient, but most of the country. And so what are, what are some of the ways that, that doctors or primary care doctors can help, you know, most of us in the FQHC world, we didn't have enough resources to look after the neediest populations. What are some of the ways in the fee-for-service system you see that we can help start addressing some of these needs? So in the system as it is currently, I don't think there are a lot of good ways because, you know, primary care provides more than a third of all visits in the country, yet we make, we, we draw down less than 5% of total healthcare spend. I mean, we're, and that's down from six and a half percent 15 years ago. So we are, we're really starved for our capacity to address anything other than the person in front of us. So, but, but right now we are working with uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and several other federal agencies to, to take a model from New Zealand and the United, United Kingdom where you use neighborhood social risk scores to identify the places and the people who are at greatest um, likelihood of having social need. And you can use that at the patient level. We call it a community vital sign because like blood pressure, this score says this person may have needs that you need to talk about. And they may, need, they may have a need for intervention. Um, at the community level, it, it helps us figure out, is this a solution we should be driving at the patient level or the community level? And, and so what we've proposed to CMS and that they're quite interested in is can we use that as a way to channel more funding to practices who care for the people in the most underserved neighborhoods? Um, it, it's a way of, of risk adjusting payment um, with a very specific goal of addressing social need. And that's what we're gonna be pursuing over the next six months with them. Wonderful. Now, but is this only working with the FQHCs or really anyone, any private practice? You know, so many independent physician associations. No, so Maryland is experimenting experimenting with this with FQHCs, but our goal is to have a policy option for Medicaid and Medicare writ large. So, and it can be fee-for-service or it could be in a capitated model, so long as it drives more resources to people who are taking care of disadvantaged patients. That's wonderful. How do you... Um... I'm just wondering, how do you keep the politicians from playing games? As you you see in some of the in some of the cities, you're starting to see gentrification, and so I can imagine that once you start paying practices in a given area more, they're gonna they're gonna feel fairly entitled to that. And so if you tie it to a geography rather than tying it to the patients, I'm just wondering. That I, I'm sure somebody's thinking about that. I was just wondering what your thoughts are about it. 
So no, that's a great question, Dr. Dan. The, 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 there's a couple things in play. You know, I, I work in D.C. most days, and D.C. has gentrified ex- a lot over the last decade. And, and I've seen some of the FQHCs relocate their practices because their patient population has migrated, has been forced to migrate in a very specific direction. So, so part of it is that, is that practices will likely migrate to, to take care of their patients, not always. On the other side, it's, uh, we're working with the Census Bureau um, and with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Stanford to build a better social deprivation index and to, to get census to become the data steward so that they are updating it on a regular basis so that as gentrification happens, we can see it two or three years later and shift the payments accordingly. Um, one of the consequences of this model that, that we hope actually sticks is that it will incentivize practices to continue to recruit and serve underserved patients. Um, that would be a that would that would be a nice problem, right? Because most fee for service doesn't drive them to do that. It, it tends to drive them to cherry pick the people who are going to cost them the least. Um, so so this we're working with Census Bureau on one side and with CMS on the other to try and bring these two things together for a, a, a better policy. Right. Well, and, you know, I know when we've presented um, on the on our Chen Med model, uh, that's a capitated model, people have uh, accused us of cherry picking and, and they're right. We do cherry pick, but we cherry pick the old the poor and the sick, because those are the ones who are most need of our services. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Joe Newhouse and others have looked at that and, and generally not found that Medicare Advantage plans do cherry pick because just as you said, folks with, with high social risk tend to develop more chronic conditions. And when they show up in the Medicare population, they have the worst risk scores. And, and if you're going to cherry pick, that's what you cherry pick. So they do tend to, to favor people in, with, with social risk. We want to make that more purposeful. We want them to focus on people with social risk um, and, and just make it explicit. The, the, the other benefit of moving to this model is that what the gaming that it, that it does avoid is not on the cherry picking side, it's on the overcoding side, uh, you know, which Don Berwick and others have recently talked about is, is a real problem for the sustainability of Medicare. Um, so it reduces the gaming opportunities. Right. And I, and I think the one, the, the people that worry me are the people who are coding and taking the money, but then not providing the services. And, Absolutely. and I think it's, um, I, I, I've heard uh, Chris Chen say that it's imperative that the primary, that the provider providing the care has to be the one putting the codes in and that not somebody else sort of, uh, uh, coding for dollars, taking the money and taking it actually away from the physician who's providing the care. Dan, I think that's an incredibly important point. So I think the the capitated plans that have done this faithfully, like you've just described, should have no trouble with this new policy because that's what they've been doing. Um, but, but we want, part of our obligation in developing this policy is not just to say how the pavement should be adjusted, but how much and with what accountability? How how should they have to demonstrate that they're using the resources to serve the needs of their patients? Um, and that doesn't mean just filling the gap for food insecurity or, or housing uh, problems, but it, it's also for hiring community health workers. It's for behavioral health. It's for social workers. It's it's really filling out the team to address need, and that's the kind of accountability that we're going to have to develop as part of it. Um, we have a question, and I feel like I'm, I'm monopolizing things. I'm going to ask this question and then turn it back over to you all. Uh, uh, Joel Jackson asks, can you provide an example of your convincing a larger health system to embrace using social determinants as means to control cost and improve quality? He says he's asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, have, I have seen health systems... I'm going to address the first one about controlling costs. I have seen health systems use social determinants as a way to target patients um, in some systems to block their access to emergency services or the hospital and others to try and create 
um, support systems in the community to try and avoid emergency department visits or hospitalizations, but by filling a purposeful need. Where that doesn't always address quality is, is in the extent that they do that. Um, so on the quality side, uh, our goal is not only to tie the policy and the allocation of resources for a health system um, to, to reducing their costs, but frankly, to, to show that they're making a dent in equity, to show that they're making a dent in, in lifespan gaps in their community um, or in infant mortality or in, in um, diabetes scores. I mean, it's, it, we, we want them to be able to demonstrate that that's happening. And because frankly, that requires a, a different commitment of resources. Thank you for answering that. I, I um, actually one of the main drivers for me to come to the Tampa Bay area was that you know, the Hillsborough County and the Tampa Bay area had some of the worst maternal mortality rates in the country. Yeah, even worse than many third world countries, in fact. So that brings me to you know. So it sounds like you know really it's the fee, the fee for service system doesn't allow as it, as the system is currently laid out doesn't really encourage or allow. The, the, the shifting of the resources unless there's some big policy changes start happening. But do you think, do you think that if, especially now with all the resources and te technology that's available, if everyone had access to a primary care delivery system, I mean, I just, I just, I just don't understand how in 2021, we still have tens of millions of people who still don't have access to primary care. Uh, Fazl, I'm with you. I, you know, I co-chaired the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report on Im implementing high-quality primary care, and and the first thing that we declared in terms of reviewing the evidence is that primary care is still the only sector of the healthcare system that improves health equity. And the second thing we said is that it should be a common good, that everyone who wants a relationship in primary care should have one. And, and that, is a, that would be a major commitment of federal policy and other payers uh, to, to make sure that that happens because it's not just about creating new access points. It's, a, it's about really working and welcoming the community's collaboration and figuring out how to get people in uh, in a way that's, that it accommodates their needs. Um, and, and that's a big deal for a lot of, of, of the communities that you're talking about. If, if, especially if you're going to make a dent in, in, um, in mortality. We're seeing that. We're seeing that. We have centers in, uh, there's a zip code in New Orleans where the life expectancy is 54, 56, and probably the most prevention hesitant, probably the most, you know, when you're talking about early interventions, I mean, this is a population that's very challenging and um, we have centers there and, even across the country where you say we can't even cross the 50% mark with influenza vaccination rates with American adults, our doctors in that zip code consistently get 97, 98% of their patients vaccinated against influenza. So when, by just by increasing, going over there, having a system in place, not only are the doctors, but all the teams of employees, many of our employees, our staff live in the same neighborhoods as our patients. Right. No, I, and that's a really important model. It, it's been demonstrated over and over again, but we just haven't, we haven't committed to, to spreading that. Um, and, and what you're talking about is it's not just people living in those neighborhoods. It's the trust that comes from recognizing this, this place is me. I mean, it's part of me. Um, and I know the people who work there. And trust is so important. Um, to people getting care when they need it and, and to recognizing these settings, not only for healthcare, but for social needs and for community connectedness. And I, I just think that's critical. You know, in DC, we have, we have parts of the geography. This is, you know, DC is a 10, 10 square miles. We have parts of the geography that 25 year life expectancy difference than others despite having, you know, several large FQHC networks. And, wow. and it's really just been a failure, I think, to, to develop the trust that's needed. That, and that trust isn't just about this patient's decision or this person's decision to become a patient. 
Um, it's also about how do we work in the community. So to your example, how giving influenza vaccinations in a barbershop or a beauty parlor, you know, finding alternative places where people go for their social connectedness and using that as a place to help them get healthy. Um, that's what we're talking about doing and enabling. And you're right, fee for service will not get us there. Yeah, the, doc, the doctor patient relationship has become so transactional that even in these populations where they're especially most resistant or they have the, the, the greatest issues so far as trusting the healthcare delivery system, you know, they, they, you have to move away from that. Tra- even the conversations, even the, the patients are being called clients now. Yeah. Doctors are called providers. The, the visits between the doctors and patients are called encounters. The language has even become transactional. We, we find that in that in the initial few interactions, building the trust in the primary care delivery team, the doctor, of course, but the entire team from the front desk staff, we have drivers uh, to the clinical staff is, is almost as critical, if not more critical than managing the pathophysiology. Seriously. Amen. And, and, yeah, our report talks about that extensively about the need for trusted healing relationships, and and the flip side of 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 this being um, transactional is that the workforce has been commoditized. It, it, it's the idea that anyone can do this at any time, and it just completely negates relationship. Um, my center, the Center for Professionalism and Value in Healthcare, uh, has a whole arm of activity called Measures That Matter. And one of the measures for primary care that we've developed and have put through the measures pipeline for the federal quality payment program is continuity. A basic thing about seeing is, are people seeing the same clinician on every time they come in? We, we have to have that as a, as a counter to, um, a commoditization of the workforce where access and filling schedules is the priority. Um, And instead the priority should be making sure that people have a relationship that we honor and respect and they can leverage for their own health. Um, Getting this measure in place has been incredibly hard, but CMS has finally recognized that it is a high value function of primary care. And uh, we think it'll be in general use next year. Wow. I, you know, I, one of the one of the best ways to build trust with the resistant population is actually by redefining the boundaries of primary care. When most people think of primary care, they think, oh, I go to the primary care doctor to get my wellness visit. I go to the primary care doctor to get my medications refilled. I go to the primary care doctor to get my referrals renewed. Uh, they don't think of primary care as being, hey, that's the place you go to for all your public health issues. That's the place you go to for your urgent care. They think when they think of vaccinations and things like that, they think of public health. They, when there is uh, an acute visit that you need to see a doctor, you don't see your primary care doctor. You go see the urgent care doctor. You go to the minute uh-huh. clinic. We, we put that all in one place. When you're there for the patients, in fact, we don't even call unscheduled visits walk-ins. We call them patients in need. Yeah. And it changes. It changes. That's how you build trust, especially with the resistant populations. Absolutely. And, and something you said earlier triggered something for me. You know, my federally qualified health center was a little two room clinic in a federal housing project. I did not look like the population. And, and so I, I, you know, for the first year, I had to really rely on my my MA and our, our community health worker to help me. You know, I'd often step out of the room and go, tell me what the heck's going on in here. I, I don't even know what is happening enough to address it. And, and, you know, I actually discovered a whole cluster of people who had uh, pica, you know, yeah. and we, we actually did a whole tree on it and figured out that it was a generational thing where it passed down from women to children. And then when the boys went through puberty, they tend to age out of it. It was a fascinating thing, but I would have never stumbled upon it if I had, if my clinical health worker hadn't said, you know, she's eating baking powder every day. <laughs> and I say, I have no idea. What are you talking about? Um, so, so often, often the relationships may not even be with the clinician to begin with. The trust may not be with the clinician to begin with, but you better have someone that can have that trusted relationship, at least to start with. So that, that brings, um, Saria is asking an interesting question. Um, 
uh, because I know the NASM report talks about team care uh, and how how do we build those teams? And she's asking, as we ask for more population health resources support for primary care to enhance team care with community health workers, care management, and others, do you have ideas regarding how we recruit and engage the pipeline workforce for these roles? I mean, going out and looking for a training program for community health workers, how to hire them, um, and how to keep them engaged. And, and as you say, to hire the people in the community that look like the people in the community to help us in, in, in those situations is vital. Yeah, no, I appreciate Soraya's question. I, it is a bit of a chicken and egg question. I think if you send enough signals that primary care is going to be paid differently, going to be paid in a way that supports population health, they will come. Um, and they won't come fast enough. But, you know, I was in that way. I graduated from medical school in 95 in that um, in that wave where HMOs were being uh, promoted in primary care. There was a promise that it was going to take off. And and a, a greater proportion of my class went into primary care than before or after. So I, I think if you send the right signals, you'll begin to recruit people uh, who really want to do this, but didn't think that it was a career opportunity until those signals appeared. I think that's the first and most important thing. The second is that we need to commit the resources. Um, and, and once the resources flow that are geared to being able to hire that community health worker, that social worker, um, then then we'll be able to do it. I, I, I'm not, I won't pretend that we have a culture that's ready for it or we have models that are disseminated widely and ready for it, but it will take some time, but the payments have to change, I think, first. Or you wind up, to your point, Fossil, earlier, you wind up with 20,000 people, physicians in direct primary care. They're, they're trying to find a way to a payment model to support the practice that they really want to deliver. Sure, and and, and, and it provides a wonderful need for a huge population, you know, for a huge chunk of the population. It, you know, the numbers, with student loan debt, medical student loan debt, you know, the numbers have been floating around 200,000, 250,000. We give a lot of residency lectures on value-based care yeah. with you know restoring the doctor-patient relationship. Um, and the numbers that we're getting are now like 300,000. I know. 300,000 plus. I know. So, so you know, I, I think about what, what when most of us completed residency training, we're completing residency training with this huge chunk of student loan debt. Most of us weren't good with financial management. We didn't have a financial advisor letting us know that, well, hey, there are certain different ways that you can tackle this problem. Debt is a problem. It's a pro part of the process. Uh, but for most of us, the first thing you want to do is get rid of this huge thing. You know, we're, you know, we were driving around cars. I think about the car that we were driving around, $4,000, $5,000 car. Just want to get rid of debt. And we, we, we couldn't even imagine. So of course that's driving so many of the uh, students to go towards these higher paying, higher paying specialties. Of course it is. Yeah, you know, a decade ago, we, we did a big, big study that showed that we lose half of our medical students from potentially going into, into primary care because of the pay gap between primary care and subspecialty options. And then we lose another group of them because when debt gets above 250,000, it becomes very difficult to manage on a primary care salary without without taking loan repayment or, or, or making choices like you said about not, in hand, not not upgrading your car or not saving for your child's college career. Um, that is changing, but not fast enough or big enough. And, and that's, we need a major shift. And, and our report basically calls that out that, you know, we need more states and even a federal effort to move towards a minimum primary care threshold for spend that we need to go from 5% to 11 or 12%. Um, and, and that needs to be, some of that will have to wind up in resolving the pay gap and, and the rest of it will have to enable us to build out the team and to manage our patient populations. You said, uh, you, said, you, said at, you, you said at least 15%, is that right? Is that what you said? <laughs> 15% would be fabulous. <laughs> so, um, Shelly asked a question, and obviously this is one of the conundrums that come with large panels, is um, how are PCP offices helping patients get past the office front staff 
wait times for your patients. And I think part of that comes with getting schedules just completely jammed and whether or not you're, I mean, it's all, if you're going to see 30 patients a day and you actually stop to talk to somebody, you're probably going to fall behind. Well, you know, the, Chris Sinsky and Tom Bodenheimer have worked this in, in, in their studies of, of practices that have high joy. Um, there's been studies out of Colorado, and there's one this week in the Annals of Family Medicine, where they're looking at shifting the physician work to the rest of the team, not to burden the rest of the team, but to give them meaningful work. So the Colorado study, uh, they, they trained up their medical assistants to be scribes and to um, do pre and post visit work with the patient. And, and so they gave every physician two instead of one MA. Um, and that, that actually freed up the physician to spend more of the time with the patient. It enabled them to see more patients because most of their time was focused on the patient, not writing things down. Um, and it actually reduced burnout by 50%. So, so there, are, there are really good examples about how the team can offload some of the burden and take on some of the responsibility that as Chris Sinsky describes, becomes meaningful work for them. They feel like they're actually invested in this patient and in the care they're giving. Um, so I, there are definitely models that we could spread like that. Wow, so, 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 so eliminating two to three hours of non-doctor work reduces burnout by 50%. And increasing the amount of face time with the patient by 50%. I mean, it, it, it's a no brainer and it actually paid for itself in the Colorado study. So uh, we have models, we just, we're scared to take the risk of, of employing them. Yes. Well, the time has gone by as usual. It always slips away. We need to take a quick 20 second commercial break. And then I'd like to come back and talk about how with capitation, we can really address the social issues that are driving so much of the waste, uh, the medical waste in the country today. ChenMed honors seniors with affordable, top-of-the-line care, and we're expanding. We're opening 25 new centers this year, including centers in two new cities, Houston and Detroit. Join us as we bring better health care to more seniors. Head to ChenMed.com forward slash physicians for more information. And we're back. Let's see, it was really only 20 seconds. Um, I remember, in, in re- especially in residency, I had no idea about value-based care or different types of payments and things like, I mean, it's just the system was the way the system was. There were, there were, there were people who didn't have insurance, people who had insurance, but their, their deductibles were too high or the co-pays were too expensive. That there, were, there weren't really much options. It's just a messy world to get into. And then, and, then, and then soon after I learned about these fully capitated options and how you're able to put resources where the need is the most. Could you please explain the concept of capitation and uh, and how these models do exist and how it helps address the, the the care that's needed, especially for those patients who are the neediest? Absolutely. So so capitation gives a practice uh, flexibility, the, the ability to use the the resources to match their their clinic staffing to the needs of the community. Um, so. So capitation has got to be funded at a level to meet to, to enable them to do that. So that's a that's a requirement of capitation. Um, but it unlike fee for service, which is is paying for things you do to people, it, it actually frees you up to not just care for people in visits, but to actually do telehealth, um, to do home visits, uh, to send community health workers out to follow up on patients. It really frees you up. Uh, one of the struggles we have with capitation is that with so many of our physicians and clinicians becoming employed is we have to make sure that the capitated payments that are designed for primary care actually reach primary care and don't just stay within the health system, uh, which might keep primary care on a fee-for-service-like model. Um, but, but assuring that the capitation has a high enough funding level and reaches primary care becomes a, an important thing for that. It's the system. We got to address the system first. We can't. We can't drive the change if if the system isn't there. The system wasn't built for us. No, it was built to a different business model, and that's why we have to change the business model. I've I've been fascinated with Maryland and Rhode Island, where they use a push pull policy. You know, they 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 
they put more money in dedicated to primary care and they capitate the, the opportunity for profit on the hospital side. So it's trying to flip the model so that primary care is no longer the loss leader. It's actually the, the revenue engine for the health system. And, and it seem, that seems to be the, the one-two punch that's most important in policy. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we're, we're, we're no longer the, the gatekeeper. We're the gateway to better exactly. health. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Bob Phillips, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure, Fassel. Thank you. Dan, thank you so much. Absolutely. Great conversation. Yes, Great it was. Ready. This is fabulous. I can't can't wait for the bonus content because I'm seeing questions are coming in to me <laughs> and getting some texts here. So we'll 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 go off the live show and then we'll record some of the bonus content for the podcast. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us tonight. For more information about tonight's topic and to explore career opportunities with Chen Med, please visit ChenMed.com. We're on track to open another 500 centers across the country. You're talking bringing on another 3,000 plus doctors, plus all the teams of people to support them. We believe access to primary care is a right, not a privilege.